topics that you think we should bring up that really hit home? Yeah, you know, I, I know that, you know, you that the topic of mental health is near and dear to your heart, right? And that's super important. So I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to touch on that too, on, on several aspects. I mean, um, you know, the whole experience that prompted me quitting my job and going to India mm -hmm. was prompted by me having this defining moment in my car where I, I literally contemplated life, like, cause I just was at a really low place. And the interesting thing about that is my doctor, I went to see my doctor literally the next day because I was concerned. She put me on antidepressants within five minutes, like so quickly. And um, I was only on them for two weeks because they really, really affected me in a negative, negative way. And I mean, I don't know if we need to go into this, but this is what came to me with that experience is I started diving deeper and deeper into my meditation and yoga practice after that. And I, I got this strong sign that, you know, you don't need to be on medication. Your, your spirit was just lost. Like your spirit was sad. So I went off the medication. Um, and I, I think, you know, in our world of mental health, yes, there's people who need to be on medication. Absolutely. But I also think sometimes the doctors are like medicating our awakening like they're medicating too quickly. So not really maybe a topic we want to talk about because I don't want like controversy, but. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that was your own experience of it. That was my experience. That was my experience. I was on an antidepressant called Effexor. And oh my gosh, even after just being on it for two weeks, I had severe withdrawal, severe withdrawal. Um, and actually the interesting thing about that in Buddhist philosophy, there's a concept called Samvega, and there's these seven kind of signs that you're going through a Samvega experience. And it's like, you know, you lose interest in things that once brought you pleasure. You have this internal feeling of being like disorganized, um, a heightened awareness of authenticity. In other words, like you start to smell the bullshit, like you start to see what's real. Um, and when you look at it, at all these signs, a lot of them can be interpreted as like, I'm going crazy. Like what's going on with me? And our Western world will like, well, you're depressed or like, let's medicate that or you're crazy or there's something wrong with you or like snap out of it. But really it's like the awakening process. So um, we to try get over that struggle of the awakening process or going through that. It's not easy. It's not all rainbows and sunshine, but sticking through it and coming out and then looking back, it's a lot easier to say, holy smokes, that snap, I've woken up, I, I see yeah. where I was. Before you were on the antidepressants, were you as bad as you were struggling through the withdrawal versus the withdrawal, sorry? Before I was on antidepressants? Mm -hmm. And you were in your car, or were you, yeah. on, were you on antidepressants? No, okay. I wasn't. I was just... Like I didn't know what the purpose of life was anymore. I just like my life felt like it had no meaning. I was making a ton of money. I was successful in my career. It seemed like I had it all, but internally I was just numb and, and empty. And um, that, that is a part, that's part of the awakening, right? That's part of the awakening. If we can really embrace that. However, it's an uncomfortable feeling. So we try and numb it with drugs or alcohol. And that's something, you know, I posted recently. I'm on day 66 with no alcohol. It seriously is changing my life. Like I, I'm not saying I'll never, ever drink again. I mean, I'm not saying I will drink again. I'm not saying I won't drink again <laughs> or you know what I mean? I'm, I just. You're taking a little break. I'm taking a break and I have so much more clarity. I feel so much more inspired um, because I feel, and, and this is, you know, in the midst of a pandemic and with COVID, there's a lot more drinking happening. And, and in fact, we glorify it. I don't see it as much now, but in the beginning months of COVID, it was very much glorified to be drinking all the time. And you know, there's um, there's a a quote. I don't know if it's a quote, but rosé all day. You've seen it. You've seen the T-shirts. You've seen the cups. You've seen the mugs. 
Um, in fact, I remember going into chapters, Indigo chapters, and there was a whole table of like pencil cases and portable wine glasses and with rosé all day written on it. And, you know, it's kind of cute, but if you're drinking rosé all day, you might, you might have a problem, <laughs> right? And, and I think that sometimes when, when we're going through a shift and a transition, which we are globally right now, we are globally going through shift and transition, especially if you're an empathetic, sensitive person, you're also picking up on the shift and transformation of everybody else, right? And so that can be really uncomfortable, which makes us turn to alcohol or food or even over exercise or something to cope and numb ourselves when when really it's it's part of our process of growth and transformation making sourdough right sourdough that's what people are oh, doing I've, i didn't ever get into that but sourdough bread is delicious <laughs> it is, yeah. yeah no you're so right and i think that's why i really loved your story is you found or you found this awakening before the pandemic and it's never i've made it it's a journey every day is a journey but a lot of people are now saying okay what was my life like pre-pandemic you know we were running from what it was a rat race right work 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 go out with your friends come home live your life with your kids blah 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 and move on now you have this time to say what is the meaning of our life what are we doing when do we say no to things what do we say yes to yeah how did you know then to look through this and go through this journey? You know, so this, um, this moment for me happened in 2009, right? So I was in that rat race. I was working in media. It was full on go time all the time. I was in advertising sales. And so um, it was all about, you know, the more successful you became, the, the higher your quotas, right? So the more you had to do the next year and it just kept growing. And I think um, one, one experience that I vividly remember where I thought this has got to stop is I remember being at my, one of my son's basketball games and my son is now a grown man. He's 29 years old, but at the time <laughs> he was younger, a lot younger. Have you belated by the way to him? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. My Taurus baby. Um, he was basketball was really his life. And I was the basketball mom. I was the mom who, you know, drove the kids everywhere to the games and packed like granola bars and Gatorade in my car for everybody. Um, he played in tournaments in Vegas every summer. There was a lot of basketball clubs in Vegas. So I attended all of those. I was manager for one of his teams at one point. And so I, I really thought like I am super present in his life, right? I'm at, I'm at all his games. And I remember being at one particular game at St. Mary's High School in Calgary and they won. And as I was driving home with him and his friends, he was super quiet. And it wasn't until all his friends left that I you know, said to him, you, know, you played a really amazing game today. You know, I'm, I'm really proud of you. And he looked at me and said, how would you know you were on your Blackberry the entire time? And that's when it kind of hit me because I, I, this was me, right? Like this obviously dates me because this is when the Blackberry was the thing. They're the best. Um, the keyboard? With the keyboard and the little turn wheel <laughs> on the side. Um, but that really struck me that even though it appeared that I was living a present life, I was really disconnected from everything, disconnected from my son, disconnected from my family, disconnected from friends and peers. Um, and most of all, completely disconnected from myself. And when we disconnect from ourselves, I mean, how can we feel whole? How can we see purpose and meaning in anything if, we at the end of the day don't really like who we are or like who we're becoming where did you find peace and joy through this transition was it immediately when you said i'm going to india or was it after you, you came back months later years later you it hit you i'm i'm at peace with myself well there's um 
there's a term in Eastern philosophy called, um, I told you about Samvega, but there's something called a samskara. And a samskara is a pattern or a rut that we keep repeating over and over and over again. And the more we repeat it, the more difficult it is to get out of it. So the way that I like to explain it is if you imagine that you're you know, driving a vehicle and you get stuck in a rut and you just keep like flooring on the gas and moving forward, you just get deeper and deeper and deeper and it's hard to get out of it. Um, so, you know, and, and I'm, I'm coming, this ties into what you've asked. When I left my corporate job, and traveled to India, I mean, it's really freaking easy to feel joy and peace and happiness when you're in an ashram at the base of the Himalayan mountains and all you do all day is chant, meditate and do yoga, right? I mean, it's, it's easy to find that type of peace. The real work is how do you maintain that when you come back? And upon my return, I launched uh, a meditation furniture and supply company. We imported meditation furniture from Indonesia and supplies from India. So that actually brought me back to India where I spent a month in Delhi um, sourcing fabric and supplies for this company. That was an experience. A month in Delhi was crazy and awesome. Um, Are you a big fan of India? I've been three times. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So I've been northern, like Rishikesh was my first time, um, which is really known as the birth town of yoga. It's on the, the base of the Himalayan mountains. It's beautiful. Um, I went to Goa on that trip as well. That's a beautiful and, place. Yeah, that was incredible too. And then I went to Delhi, spent a month in Delhi, which is a completely different experience, <laughs> right? And you want to talk about beautiful chaos, you know, that is one thing that fascinated me about India is that, um, you know, like just driving, for instance. The rickshaws. Like, <laughs> there, well, there's rickshaws and then you'll have like a Mercedes G wagon next to you. And then there's a cow blocking the road and then there's a rickshaw and the, it, and everything just flows. Everything managed to, manages to flow, which is something we can, you know, learn from here, right? Is that even amongst pure chaos, can we still learn to flow? Can we still learn to flow? So going back to what you asked, um, Just I fell into the same- you go, Did you go there alone? Um, the first time I went, I went with a partner that, that was like, like my boyfriend at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other two times I went alone. Wow, and you were never afraid? No. Good for you, yeah. No, okay. no, I wasn't. I wasn't. The second time when I was there, um, I did have someone with me to help translate. So that was like fantastic. And I had a driver and everything as well. But I love solo travel. I mean, I've traveled a lot on my own. I've been to Europe on my own. I, you know, I've, I've been to many cities across the US on my own and, and across Canada on my own. And I feel like solo travel allows us to really learn about ourselves interesting right now though but <laughs> yeah well there has been no travel there's been no travel anyway so you, you know in terms of you asked me about like finding joy and peace and happiness i i think when i talked about these samskaras and these patterns i fell into the same pattern of work, work being a workaholic even with the meditation furniture company i was teaching meditation workshops i was selling meditation furniture and I was stressed out and burnt out because that's a pattern, right? That, that was a pattern. So, um, yeah, I, when, when it, when it kind of hit me and I ended up selling that company and, and starting a, a different transformational coaching program and business, um, I had to be really aware of falling into those patterns and falling into those patterns and falling into those patterns because when we're familiar with them and when that's what we're used to it it's like that rut if it's really really deep it might it might take a while to actually get out of it right we got to turn the wheel and keep trying and keep trying um but i would say that honestly the last six weeks of my life have felt the most <laughs> 
peaceful and joyful than I can recall in a very long time. Wow. Okay. Where did you find that peace or what changed in you to allow peace in your life? Um, I had an experience happen in February that truly sideswiped me. Have you ever been sideswiped before? Have something happened that you really weren't expecting? 100%. Yeah. And, you know, might involve people that you trusted and um, that you put a lot of faith in. And it was it was super, super difficult for me. And I went into a pretty dark hole at the beginning of February. That's this year, 2021. That's this year, 2021. Okay. Yeah. And I knew, like, I've been doing this work for over a decade. So I, I knew in my heart and in my being that this is happening for a reason, right? This is happening for a reason. But I, my mind didn't want to believe that right? My mind just really didn't want to believe that. And oftentimes when we're sideswiped in that way, um, we want to blame. We want to blame the other person or we dwell on what could I have done differently? What did I do? What did I, we, or we blame ourselves, right? And that, that doesn't allow for any peace or joy or acceptance. And in, um, in my coaching, I, I talk a lot about surrender and the concept of surrendering to what is. And honestly, what happened over the last six weeks to two months, I truly feel that giving up alcohol is a large part to do with it. And I wasn't drinking a ton at all, right? I mean, it was very much a glass of wine at night, not even every night. Um, and I think that you have to know yourself well enough. Some people can do that. I have mental health issues in my family. There is suicide in my family. There is addiction in my family. And so I have to recognize and honor that that DNA lives in me and that alcohol affects me emotionally the next day and sometimes for two or three days. And, and you so don't mean a hangover. You mean like it'll literally affect you in terms of how you think, how you react to people. Yes. Okay. Yes. Like it, my sense of patience is a lot like my, I have less patience for people. I, um, it's easier for me to spin into a state of anxiety or over analyzing. Um, I wouldn't say like depression, but maybe like a low level feeling like just feeling down and not seeing possibility not really being able to see what's possible. And if we're not super aligned and clear, um, do you believe in manifestation? 100%. Okay, awesome. It's really tough to manifest what you want in life, what you hold as a vision when you're not feeling aligned. And not feeling aligned can happen in many ways. It can happen by being in relationships that we know are a lie. It can happen of being in jobs or careers that we don't like or maybe don't align with our values. It can happen with alcohol or drugs. Um, it can happen when we, you know, whenever we're, we're lying to ourselves, because there's several ways that we lie to ourselves. And so I think that I've just, I feel so incredibly aligned right now. And by being aligned, I can see it. I can witness it happening in my life that the people, the opportunities to make my vision a reality are showing up. And with that comes this incredible sense of certainty. And I think that's what we don't have right now in our world, right? Is we don't have a lot of certainty. However, even in the uncertainty, can we believe enough to have certainty, if that makes sense? I have no idea what will happen. I have no idea what will happen with my business. I have, you know, just as much as you, I have no idea what will happen with the world. Um, but in your own little world, can you? Yeah, like in, inside, I, I, I feel like everything that's happening in my life, but also... I see something bigger for our world. I, I, I really feel that there's meaning out of all of this chaos we've experienced over the last 
year and a half, that we are going to emerge stronger as a humanity and as a whole. And it's going to be messy, exactly. right? Yeah. You know, Do you think we, we need talk- to be gentle and kind with one another and softer with each other? Because like you said, well, and, and we've seen it, is it, it's been a brash world. It's, it's a go, go, go world before this. Do you think we're going to tone it down a bit and say, okay, when everyone goes back to work, we're not going to be as rough and tough with them anymore. It's going to be a different way of dealing with them. Business will be well, done differently. I already see business being done differently, right? So first, when people say, you know, I, when things go back to normal, I don't really want things to go back to normal. Like let's, we get to define what normal is now, right? This new normal. I don't really, I, I, like, you know, when people go back out, they're just, it's a shit show out there, right? So. Yeah. Do you like I, this in a way? Do you find peace in all this? You know what? My parents ask me like, don't you get lonely? Cause I, you know, I live alone and um, I'm grateful. My son lives eight minutes away. So we hang out a lot. Um, I don't feel lonely at all. I really don't. I, um, yeah, I, I've spoken with several people who have shared that this has been a wake up call for them to do things differently, to do business differently, to do life differently, to do their relationships differently. And, you know, as we were sharing our process of awakening, involves turbulence, right? It does involve turbulence. So I appreciate that you shared, like if we can just be kind and gentle and compassionate with each other, knowing that we're all going through some form of turbulence right now that is less connected to the outside world than it is connected to us. It's an internal disruption. We're being asked to think differently and we're being asked to like, elevate the way that we think so that we can um, come together as a stronger humanity. hundred percent. I feel like everything changed. I mean, even for myself, but I put alcohol out. I just got rid of it for a bit. Again, who knows if I will again, but for now I took a break and the clarity, the confidence, and you said the possibilities, hands down, you can see things clear and you're, you're ready to tackle them on without paranoia or anxiety. And yeah, that fear that holds us back, right? That little voice that says, no, not today. Have another glass, yeah. or have another drink. Yeah. yeah, which is interesting because, you know, we'll have a drink and it can generate confidence, right? It's like, yeah, like we're going to, I'm going to do this. And yeah. sometimes some of my best writing came when I was like having a glass of wine. Um, but it's, it's the after effect that kind of shakes that confidence, right? So it's, it's false confidence, it's like, hey, let's go out and talk some business. All right, want to meet up for a few drinks? Sure. It's never, nothing ever gets done. And oh my gosh. I worked in media for a decade. I know <laughs> all about, it was always about. What going company did you work? Um, I worked in radio. So I worked um, with Astral Media, which is now Bell Media. So I worked for CJ and Vibe. Nicely done. Yeah. Yeah. Do you miss it? Part of that life? You know what? Um, and I'm fine if you put this on, but um, I... What I miss is I, I miss like interacting with clients and my team members. Like I, I miss getting to know clients, getting to know their business, coming back and putting together the perfect marketing proposal for them. And then, you know, I, I do love sales. I think that, you know, if you're selling something you believe in, sales is a great thing. I loved um, presenting them with this proposal and then going back to the team and working on the radio creative. And I missed the creativity of it. I certainly, I'm, I miss that energy. I really do. I work from home, right? It's, it's different. And as I said, I, I'm not lonely, but sometimes I miss that energy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I'm on social media a lot and that's my world or being social. So when the pandemic happened, at first, I was like, I don't know if I struggle with this or not. But now it's like, don't disturb my peace. I like my bubble. I like being alone. Yeah. There's a beauty in it. I don't know. Yeah. I've been an introvert this whole time. Who knows? Yeah. I know. I, I, um, did you consider yourself an extrovert before? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And now I've realized I'm the opposite. Hmm. Yeah. Which is interesting. I don't know. I don't crave the external attention. Maybe I do with social media. So maybe I still am an extrovert, but I don't need that physical anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I have a little dog and me and that's it. 
And he's at doggy daycare right now, so that's good. He's getting his fix. <laughs> he's getting his social fix. Yeah. 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 Hmm. That's interesting. I wonder, that makes me cu curious if people who kind of claimed that they were extroverts have mm. shifted because I was very much an extrovert my entire life. And I mean, now, I mean, I, I do, I love my space alone. Like I love my space alone and just, I have my routines and everything feels very calm. Um, do I want to be alone for the rest of my life? No, <laughs> I, I, I do envision partnership at some, at some point, um, but I'm not going to force anything. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Yeah. Has your threshold dropped for what disturbs your peace? Mm. Yes, absolutely. I was just sharing this with someone the other day. Do you have any experience with anxiety? I, I think after, yeah, when I was drinking. Yeah, okay. It still creeps up here and there. So you know how anxiety can be like, it's a, it, you can physically feel it in your body, yes. right? And some people may have different experiences. For me, I can feel it in my chest. Mm -hmm. Sometimes my knees would even go weak. My thoughts start to race and, You're you know, it's, yeah, yeah, it's all encompassing. Um, one big shift that I've noticed is that I can literally feel anxiety before it manifests in my body. Like I can detect the energy of anxiety. I can detect that it's coming and I can immediately kind of like, whatever, push it away. And that's really been, I would say the last month where it's, it's a really cool feeling because there's certain thoughts that will still come into my mind that would typically cause me to feel anxiety. And now I can literally, it's like Teflon. It just, just kind of rolls off me. Wow. It's, yeah. It's, it's cool. What do you do though? Cause I mean, you have to become so with know yourself so much or become so self-aware to know that. Well, I, I think it's, there's still a lot of me that I know I need to learn about for mm -hmm. sure. I think we're always, you know, and, and so we should, because we're always changing and always in evolving to be in a state of self-inquiry, right? Always like in a state of self-inquiry. Why do I think that way? Why do I do the things I do? Um, I think what's shifted for me is really fully embracing the things I cannot control, right? It's just, there's so many things that we cannot control. And when we learn to let those things go, I mean, it doesn't mean we don't care, um, but when we learn to kind of be non-attached to that stuff, um, I think that's when we can allow, like, you know, put, put on the Teflon suit, right? And things just kind of like flow off of us. You know, it's funny, people that struggle with mental health oftentimes like to speak on it, maybe directly or indirectly or support it. You got into coaching to help individuals because you were struggling or you found ways to cope with your struggling. How did that happen? And what exactly do you do to help people that are needing you? Mm. Well, um, my, my coaching is a little different than most coaches because I follow a structure based on 10 ancient principles that I discovered when I was first in India. And these principles have nothing to do with physical postures, like the physical postures of yoga, right? Even though I was studying yoga, um, they come from a 2000 year old scripture and they were meant to be practice before you ever step foot on a yoga mat. And they're, they're pretty basic, simple principles like kindness and truth and non-attachment and surrender. And I, when I got back from India, I realized that nobody was really teaching about this in our Western world, right? I mean, to give you an example, in the Yoga Sutras where these principles were discovered, it's, it's written almost like a Bible and there's 193 verses in it. And out of the 190, 
193, oh, 196, 196. Out of the 196, only three of them talk about physical postures. Like, that's kind of crazy, okay. right? Only yeah, three I of them. never thought, okay. But in our Western world, we're all about the body, right? So it's become about the physical aspect. So I started taking these principles and fully applying them into my own life. And I, you know, they're originally written in Sanskrit. I translated them into English and thought, okay, how could I practice this in my life, in my relationships, in my career or business, in my finances? And so I did an experiment with myself. And remember when I was talking about alignment? That was the first thing that I noticed when I really started diving into them is that I felt really aligned, like really aligned. And manifesting became super easy because I had this set of 10 tools to keep me aligned. So I took those tools and developed a workshop around them. And I did workshops around the world um, that turned into a weekend retreat, um, diving into these principles and teaching others how to apply them into their lives. And then that turned into a coaching program. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Which interestingly enough, I, I put everything on hold in 2016 because I went off track again. You see, like, this is the thing about when we have an awakening and we can discover peace and joy and happiness, if we think that we have to hold on to that forever, that's a lot of pressure. And then you're going to drop it. Yeah. We're still human. We're still human. So I went into a pattern again and put everything on hold. And it was... Um, Jackie, can I just ask you, was it a, like relationships you'd get into that would bring you back into the down and up and down? Relationships were um, a, a part of it. Right. Um, in particular, when I was coaching, it was called the Yoga Code at the time. When I was coaching the Yoga Code, um, I, I hit this wall of feeling lonely. I, I talked about not feeling lonely now. I felt lonely then because I was coaching using... It wasn't Zoom at the time. It was Skype. Um, I was building this online presence. I started dealing with imposter syndrome of who the hell am I to teach yoga philosophy? And I felt like a fraud mm. because there were aspects of my life that I wasn't in integrity with. And But isn't it a journey? When it's totally a journey. Now you have peace within that. So when you look back, it's now you have that element. And maybe you're saying, oh, I have to figure these things out. Well, maybe you're not like you, the word you used. You're a human. I'm human. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I don't like expecting myself to, I have to practice these 10 principles 100% every single day in order to feel validated to teach them. Impossible. They'll leave right? you on a psychosis. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have so, you found peace within yourself through it all? I've led a very colorful life. Very colorful life. I was very curious as a teenager and, you know, made some, honestly, sometimes I'm surprised that I'm still here. I, I truly believe with all of my heart that becoming pregnant with my son was a gift from God to keep me on this earth. I, I truly believe that, that God believed like you're here for a purpose. We need to keep you here. So here is this gift because my life started to change after um, I discovered that I was pregnant with my son. And so I don't, everything, everything happened for a reason. I don't regret one single decision or experience that I had in my life because with my coaching clients um, and possibly in a memoir that I'm working on, I'm going to get really honest about everything because I believe that when we're open and we share, and that's what I love about your podcast, you really bring people on who are open and honest and vulnerable. And when we can be open and honest and vulnerable about issues like mental health, um, it gives other people permission to do the same. And so I have found peace and joy and happiness. And I know that I can experience that even if my external world is in chaos. Oh, I love that. 
Now, Jackie, if someone wants to get a hold of you, how can they do so? Are you taking on any new clients right now? You know, if anyone wants to like go to my website and they can learn when I'm actually fully launching, they can just sign up and kind of follow, follow along the journey, which I think sometimes is fun for people to follow a journey. And what is your social media for individuals that want to follow you? Jackie Dumain. Yeah, very simple. <laughs> Are you French originally? Is that what that is? Oui, je parle français. Um, wow. I didn't speak a word of English until I was six. Wow. So you're mm -hmm. not originally from Calgary? I'm originally from a small town in Manitoba called Ile des Chaines, population 1100. And because my father has 13 siblings, half the town were my cousins <laughs> and relatives. <laughs> yeah. Have you gone back and visited your town? Great question. Um, we went back, oh gosh, I want to say it was maybe four, four years ago, four or five years ago. And um, like one of the main streets in town is like named after my family. It's Avenue du Maine. Okay. Du Maine. And um, the town has grown. I mean, it's a full on town. And I remember growing up, we used to go into the city, into Winnipeg, right? And it was like a big outing to go into Winnipeg. And on this last trip, when we went back to my hometown, I realized, oh, it's like 11 kilometers away. <laughs> it, it really was like a, like a suburb of Calgary. But back then, it just felt like a big, such a big city compared to our small town. Are most of your clients local or are they from all over? International. International. Okay. Yeah. 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 And, and, and mainly like the kind of people that have been attracted to me and attracted to this work are people who have, you know, they've, they've done some of the work. They've started to explore spirituality. They know that there's more out there. Many of them are change makers or thought leaders or visionaries. Um, they're, they're really driven by, by purpose. Um, and they really want these tools to just like, it, they really do act like a roadmap to keep you aligned. Interesting. Well, I appreciate your time today, Jackie. Yeah, it's been fun.